Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Mr. Sokowski. I teach AP World and AP Euro. Today's video, I'm going to be doing a quarter one review of AP World. This is going to be the third part of that review because the PowerPoint slide is about 100 slides. This is basically putting together about an hour of a review for your first quarter of the major concepts you want to know. And if you want a copy of this, the link to getting a copy is in the description. Uh, that being said, we left off talking about the Mongols, which is a huge one to know for AP World History. Like, I can pretty much guarantee you're going to get a, a Mongols question within it, right? Now, the idea that's going on um, by 1347 is this huge thing called the Black Death or the Black uh, Plague, right? The Black Death or the Black Plague is, is an epidemic, something that we're actually familiar with in 2020, which is kind of sad, but that's basically the issue that's going on throughout Europe. Um, you could get something on the AP exam with the Black Death. Basically, it's an epidemic that starts in Sicily and moves its way up through Italy, and then it basically um, goes to Europe. It kills about one third in every person in Europe, so it's a huge uh, issue. It's carried um, on fleas on rats, which there's a fun video down here that you can kind of watch. It's basically considered an epidemic. Um, the reason why, uh, how you would get a question phrase on the AP exam with the Black Death would be like uh, describe the issues of you know how you see it in the art which you see skeletons in the art depicting of what issues and then it'll be like the spreading of disease or the bubonic plague or the death, black death would be the way you probably see the question or it could be describing like the effects of the black death and you can say you know inflation of payments because there's not a lot of people to do those jobs so those jobs now are more valuable thus creating some sort of influx or creation of um, problems with money inflation is a rise of prices and that's connected to issues of the Black Death. You can see it today with, when um, the pandemic hit with uh, COVID, how that influenced economic um, standings for a lot of people and businesses, unfortunately. So you can kind of see that correlation even today. Um, and that's something that I was dealing with before. The Hundred Years' War was from uh, 1337 to 1453. Uh, it's called the Hundred Years' War. It's a little bit over 100. The whole issue with this is that it's between um, England and France, these issues of a series of wars that are happening for a long time. And basically, um, it's about claiming the French throne. And the whole story of this is that you want to know that Joan of Arc, basically the English were winning in the beginning and then uh, for a long time. But then the French come back and they come back with this martyr later on, a martyr named Joan of Arc. She's a 17-year-old girl uh, who comes in and basically turns the tide of uh, the Hundred Years' War and basically uh, pretends to be a guy, obviously, because they're not going to let her fight originally. She fights anew. She gets captured eventually by the English. They say, who sent you? She said, God sent me. They burn her at the stake as a witch, which they think they're done with her. But in reality, she becomes a martyr again. Remember back to those ideologies of earlier um, Christian um, faith, the martyrs, and how they were influential of inspiring um, Christianity earlier on. She's a martyr, and she's basically someone who still inspires as a symbol for the French to fight. So she ends up living for forever, becoming a martyr. Now, the Hundred Years' War, the, the idea of what's happening with this affected the future of uh, Europe and the world because a couple of things happened. France becomes a superpower after this, after it wins the Hundred Years' War. English can gave more par uh, money to Parliament because they were asking more money to fund wars and set them on new uh, uh, versions of expansion. So the ideas of parliamentary systems or Parliament become stronger during this age after the Hundred Years' War. Um, castles started to disappear because there's this new advent of the cannon, which basically makes castles in medieval or Middle Ages style of defenses obsolete. Um, and basically not feudal wars, to, but basically start to hire soldiers to do their fighting. So there's no feudalism that starts to become an archaic style and it starts to get phased out during this age because now you want to have a hired soldier, you don't want to have a peasant that's going to be your lord, you have to train them and do this whole thing. It becomes more on um, the Hundred Years' Wars where you start really seeing the high middle age. It starts, the world starts to awaken for the world around it. Europe recovered from the Black Death and the population and manufacturing grew. You see a boom in economics. You see when you know bought people are getting jobs and things are kind of getting back going. There's a huge boom. Um, and the New Age state set the stage for the Renaissance, the new rebirth of art, the Reformations, the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther and the Catholic Reformation with... Um, the Jesuits and Maria Teresa, and then you start seeing the Age of Exploration. So the Hundred Years' War is basically a setting stone of history, and it's a turning point where you see Europe awaken from its past, and it's like 
the next stages where kind of like it kind of everything goes open, like the whole world's open. Now, during this time, there is a major thing that you need to know for AP World History: the Hundred Years' War, Joan of Arc. Not as much as the Ottoman or the Safavid Empire you would get for AP uh, World History. Because remember, it's world concepts they're going to be asking you. Uh, the two dynasties that ruled the Middle East were the Ottomans and the Safavid Empire. Like you need to know your Ottomans, you need to know your Mongols. If I was going to say any major empire that's out there that you might not be too familiar with, those are like the real, real ones you really need to know. And for sure, you're going to get something within there. These two empires owe much of their success to the new weapons. For instance, the Ottomans and the Safavid were known as the gunpowder empires. They were the first to use actual Chinese gunpowder from the idea of fireworks implemented it into a trajectory, a weapon, and create cannonballs and actual guns. They're known as the Gunpowder Empire and it gives them an advantage, a tech advantage, because they have new weapons. Now the Ottomans were the Turkish-speaking nomadic people who migrated Central Asia into Northwestern Asia Minor. The Ottoman Empire expansion crumbled of the Byzantine Empire. So remember the Roman Empire broke into two sections? And then you had the Byzantine Empire left over with Justinian and Theodora. Remember the Justinian Code? That's one of those kind of concepts you might get. The Ottomans come in and finally break what's rest, rest of, uh, what's left of the Roman Empire, which is the Byzantine Empire, and they completely wipe it out on this side because this is this is a good illustration. The Roman Empire was pretty much like all this, but then the Roman Empire fell, broke into two. This was what would the Byzantine Empire be, the remaining part of it, which lasted for a couple hundred years longer, like 900s and so forth, past that time. And then the Ottomans, which is a Muslim-based empire, comes in and takes over and kind of facilitates and changes what would be the Byzantine Empire to the Ottoman Empire. You can see the perfect illustration again with the Hagia Sophia. It was a basilica. It was a Christian symbol. Then the Ottomans came in and became a mosque, Muslim uh, church. And you can kind of see the dynamics of one building, very famous building, kind of being transformed into by two different religions, by two different empires coming in. After several failed attempts, Mehmet II has finally succeeded in 1453 to basically break down the, uh, the main state of Constantinople, which is Istanbul. So most of the territory fell to the Ottoman Empire, but reality is Mehmet is actually the one that finally just broke the last gem, which was Constantinople, because it had a great defense. And they were basically, once that was gone, it was officially the Byzantine Empire was like the last little hold was taken over. A two-month siege finally overtook the city. He ruled over the air for the next 200 years. Not he, but his people, obviously. He's not within 200 years. Now, the major WAP guy you want to know is once the Ottomans come in is Suleiman the Magnificent. Now, how do we describe Suleiman the Magnificent? His turban is enormous. A lot of my students say it looks like an onion. If you remember that, more power to you. But we got to remember, this is the Muslim-based empire. They're not going to wear jewels, right? They're going to be basically based on the ideas of the Prophet Muhammad. So having a bigger turban basically signifies your dominance, and it was a style of them. But he's known as the best person to know from the Ottoman Empire. So if you're going to know someone from the Ottoman Empire, you need to know your Suleiman. Okay? Sultan Suleiman, he was named as the lawgiver. He was brilliant. He modernized the ideas of the Ottomans. Um, he ruled with them as one of the most powerful, largest empires in Europe and the Middle East. So the Ottoman Empire is huge as like a land-based uh, land quasi-water-based empire, which would be the remnants of um, that. Now, while he's ruling, he implements a lot of Muslim ideologies, such as Sharia, which is the idea of royal ed edicts came from um, order and command having the force of law. So this idea of Sharia law is basically kind of law that's given to people, but it's based on the ideas of Islamic backgrounds. Okay, so that's one word you want to know in there. Uh, they have different social classes. Um, every area has social classes, so that's a good theme to think about when you're doing AP World History. You're not going to get so many bold words or definitions. You're going to get more thematic approaches. So compare the society of uh, Europe to the society of Ottoman Empire, right? Discuss the uh, geography or environment of the Ottoman Empire compared to the Mongols. And here the Ottoman Empire you'd say has sea-based roots because it's Byzantine the Mediterranean. The Mongols don't. They're land-based empire and they're nomadic people. Those are two easy ways you can kind of do it. And you don't know how to know every little detail from everything going forward. Again, if you like the video, like, subscribe, jazz hints. Now they had the men of the sword, which are soldiers, men of the pen, lawgivers, men of the negotiation, merchants. Men of husbandry, which are basically the farmers and herders. 
The important thing to know about this is that they're leaving out women. That's one of the major themes you can also apply. The idea of genders is one of the issues that you can see a difference between uh, the Ottoman Empire, for instance, and maybe, you know, Middle Ages or High Middle Ages Europe. That when the men were going off and fighting in Europe, the women could take over certain duties. In Islam, it's, it's part of the religion that they are not, and thus you see it in the actual social fabric. They're not allowed to hold any positions or any any types of land holdings or jobs or anything like that. So that's one of those distinctions you can put between an Islamic empire and a Christian empire too. Um, the society of the Ottoman Empire consisted of many religious uh, religions. They were a diverse culturally ruled empire and compared to other places they were actually very like for instance Spain and the Reconquista kicking out the Muslims and the Jews. The Ottoman Empire was tolerant of other people's religions because basically Muslims have their their they're they are the continuation of Christian and Judaism. So they're tolerant over their religions. The only thing if you're living as a Christian in a Muslim empire or a Jew in a Muslim empire, a Jewish person in a Muslim empire, you would have to pay like a toll. But that was basically it. They weren't gonna convert you, they weren't gonna do a heresy on you. Like just you wanna practice your stuff, that's cool. Just pay us a toll. You're not in with like, you know, the you don't get the Ottoman Muslim deal kind of thing. So each of them had their own educate leader educations. The Jewish leaders consisted of many people who were expelled from Spain. They brought international banking connections with them when they came over to the Ottoman Empire. And also the Janissaries. So this is one of those kind of like messed up parts where the forced, where the elite force of Ottoman ar army, they were comprised of slaves made up of conscripted young Christian boys who were forbidden to marry. So this is one of those things that they actually buy slaves as Christians. They kind of harness them into their they're like elite force, these Janissaries. And they were the brightest students, received special education to become government officials, judges, lawyers, and poets. So it's like he wants to create a intellectually thriving society, but the way it's done is, is, is not something that you would think of as cool. Right? Like you shouldn't be doing that to other people. But the other side of it is it becomes a very powerful empire because of the way the laws and, and the way it's kind of like created that way. But that's one word that would pop up with it in your AP test somewhere, like Janissaries. The end of the Ottoman Empire is about in the 1700s. There's a weak European advances. Um, Russia and other European powers captured the Ottoman lands. So kind of like World War One is coming around, the Ottoman Empire is ready to decline. And then by World War Two, Cold War, like the Ottoman Empire, it ceased to, to be no more. And it basically crumbles under the other powers coming up. The Safavid Empire was in the 1500s. And the Safai uh, was basically a uh, Persia, which would be modern day Iran. They were in, engaged in war against the Mughal and the Ottoman Empire. Okay, now they were um, Shiite Muslims, the Safai Empire, who were enforced their beliefs on their empire. Ottomans were the Sunni Muslims who, did, who basically despised the Shiites as heretics. So that's the way you would see these two uh, empires also relate if you got something in there that the Ottomans were the Sunni, kind of any good Muslim. The uh, Shiite Muslims, the Safavid Empire, were like it has to be in the bloodline, the rule. You think of like the Shah um, in the Middle East kind of thing. That's the idea that's going on with the Safavid Empire. Under the Shah, the one you want to know the, the most is Shah Abbas the Great, and Abbas Absaid, the Absaid dynasty. He's the one you would want to know going together. He revived the glory of ancient Persia because they have a long history in Persia of having ancient empires. He centralized the government, created powerful military forces, modeled on the Ottoman Janissary, so like the elite forces to kind of have roles in government and, and armies and so forth. A mixture of forces of diplomacy, having laws again, a capital of Ishfan, which became the center of the international silk traders during the 1500s, that middle, the silk roads kind of thing, like they're like thriving. The, the middlemen that I'm talking about are the Ottoman Empire and the upside uh, empire those are the ones that are really banking with the middle um the middle as the middle men during those times now remember when the age of exploration happens they tried to cut out these middlemen which are these muslim empires um and that's also when they find the new world columbus the Safavid empire declined after death of shabas um and the new dynasty of kujars came over they made Tehran their capital until 1925. The one you want to know, Shah Abbas the Great and the Apsite Dynasty would be what would be the idea of modern day Iran, Middle East. And then you would have the ideas of um, the Ottoman Empire, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, the guy with a big turban, looks like an onion. 
and uh, the Janizaries. So those were like some of the big things you would know uh, that you would get some sort of con connection to. You don't know, I need to know every little detail, like the men of the sword and stuff. Those are some of the bigger things. Now here you have the idea of the Renaissance, the revival of the ancients. Um, it's very brushed upon lightly in AP world because it's also focused again really heavily in AP Euro for another AP class you guys could potentially be taking. But for the uh, Renaissance, it's a revival of the ancient Greeks, humanism, the idea of the humanities, bringing it, making it look as realistic as possible. And this is the emergence of Europe out of the ancient, um, the high middle ages, right? Feudalism, people are fighting and trying to survive. Now there's like an intellectual revival and what they're doing is they're reviving the ancient Greeks and Romans, the poems, the society, the art, the architecture, the government. They're doing everything again. It's like a reawakening again, right? Like a rebirth is Renaissance and humanities, humanities or humanism is the idea that's flowing in there. Just think of it as natural as possible. The major place of uh, the Renaissance is Italy. That's because it's broken into the city-states after the crumbling of the Roman Empire. But the city-states are, are run by powerful banking families for trade, the Ottoman Empire again, remember? Um, they had the remnants of the Roman Empire, so structurally there's still easy trade uh, capacities back and forth across, making Italy a prime location for the Renaissance. And also it's the center of a uh, major religion in the world, which is the Vatican, the Catholics, right? So why does the Renaissance happen in Italy? It's not because people just said, hey, let's do the Renaissance in Italy. It's all these different factors coming in that makes it what it is today. And the banking family says so the monet monetary value to support the arts. It has a trade and function to have um, uh, the ideas flowing back and forth. It has a major religion to center it as a focal point of the world. So it's like the perfect location to happen. Again, the one you want to know is the Medici. Um, they were the most high ranking of Venice, uh, of one of the city states, Venice. And Cosmo de' Medici, or um, Cosmo's grandson of uh, Cosmo de' Medici, his, his grandson Lorenzo de' Medici was a very famous patron of the arts. And this is when you start seeing the Renaissance boom. Now, the patron of the arts means that these people, these banking families, were so affluent that they, they want to show off their money their wealth and how do you do that you can't buy you know cars today you want to show off your big mansion you would throw art poems architecture you would have the best of the best and that's how they showed off their wealth during this time it made it a focal point of the the world venice and it became like um sorry florence and it became um it's actually florence it became the New York or Paris of its time kind of thing. So the Medici of Florence is the biggest one to know. Sorry, not Venice. New artistic styles, but then it goes all over Italy in the Renaissance and it goes to Northern um, because everyone else is trying to compete. Uh, the new artistic styles of the time came along. Uh, the ideas of a focal point uh, came. And uh, again, I'm going to leave it off here, but if you like the video, like and subscribe and then uh, we'll start off continuing with the renaissance going forward with there all right thank you guys just sign on jazz hands bye